Okay, the message this morning, the title of the message this morning is Know Your Enemy. Know Your Enemy. Throughout the past year, from the start of the year, uh, we've been talking and speaking uh, on the subject of knowing God and making clear that it's not just enough to know about God. A whole lot of people know about God, but that we need to know Him. So, throughout the year, we've been talking about knowing God. This morning, I want to take a different tact. And so, I want to talk about knowing your enemy. You see, it's one thing to know who your friends are, and it's good to know who your friends are. It's good to know the people who really, truly have your back. It's good to know that whatever you face in life, that there are always going to be those who will be there with you there for you and there to support you. And even the best of friends can at times let you down. We fully understand that even the best of those in leadership, the best of pastors can also let you down. We let each other down, but that does not remove the friendship and that does not remove the care when it comes to true friendship. So, it's one thing to know who your friends are. Of course, it's another thing to know who your enemies are and particularly who your enemy is. One of the reasons I believe why some people fail to make it as Christians is because they fail to truly know God. They want to get information, and that's good to learn as much as you can about God. But one of the reasons why people fail to make it as Christians is because they stop off with the information, and they fail to truly get to know God in a real and personal way. But another reason why some fail to make it as Christians is because they fail to know who the enemy is. And so, I want to say first and foremost this morning that we do need to know God before and over and above everything and anything else. We need to know God. We need to know, to know God as God, not just as a body in the sky. Some people talk about God these days as if we're bringing God down to where we are, and yet He came to bring us to where He is. And we want to talk in terms of, oh, God's my best. Yes, He is our best friend, but we need to keep in mind that He is God. When we sing about Him today, we're singing about God. We need to keep that in mind. We're singing and talking about God, the Creator, the Creator of the universe, the Giver of life, the One who's our Lord and our Savior. We're talking about the One who has not only given us this life, but that He's become our Father. He is our Heavenly Father. Jesus taught us to pray and taught us to pray not just to a distant God, but the one who has become and is our heavenly Father. And you need to know today, friends, that this God is not against you. This God is for you. He is your friend. He's someone you can trust and someone you can stay close to. It's good to know the people you can trust. It's good to know those who've got your back. It's good to know those that you can truly stay close to you because they're not in it for what they can get out of it. They're there because they truly want to support and want to bless you. God wants to bless us today. God wants to bless you. God wants to be close to you, and God wants you to remain close to Him. We shared last week that we need to know God with our heart. You need to know Him with your heart but you'll never know Him with your heart until you first of all give Him your heart. Too many of want to stop short of giving Him our gifts and our abilities and our, our, our talents and even our finances. We think, as long as we give these things to God, that will keep God happy. No, God says, give me your heart. He wants an intimate relationship with every person in this place today. And if you don't know God in this way, then you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for failure. But the point of this message this morning is to say that although we need to know God as our friend, that we also need to know our enemy. You need to know who your enemy is. But let's be clear, first of all, as to who the enemy is not. Your enemy is not someone sitting in another part of this church building right now. Your enemy is not someone who's sitting in another another church building right now. Your enemy is not the person you haven't spoken to in a while, whether it's for weeks or for months or sometimes even years. Your enemy is not the person who smashed into your car, not the person who stole your car, 
Anyone have your car stolen? Who's had your car stolen? One, two, can't hang your hands up. You're, you had two cars stolen. Three, four, five, six, seven. Boneyard, why would anybody steal your car? I think that it left you one instead of stealing yours. Oh, they got a puncher. There's no diesel in it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, Kathleen put her hand up because we had two cars stolen, not just one, two cars, one we never saw again. And uh, the other one, uh, we got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning from the police. Police said, is that Mr. McKee? I said, it is. He said, do you own uh, a brown Ford? And I said, yes, I do. He said, can you tell me where it is? I said, well, it's parked outside the front of the house. He said, can you take a look and see if it's still there? And the moment that he said that, I knew I'm going to look stupid if I look out through the blinds, the curtains, see if the, because it's not going to be there, or why is he on the phone? But I looked out, and right enough, the car was gone, and uh, he told me where it was. It was wrapped around a lamppost at the bottom end of the Ligony Road. That's where it was. So we had two cars, cars stolen. We also had a third car that was totally bombed and destroyed at the front of our house, and many of you remember that particular story. It was a black Ford, um, Ford, uh, <laughs> name of Ford, what the big Ford? Huh? Mondeo. Did you say Mondeo or did she say Mondeo? No, she said Mondeo. It was a Ford Mondeo, black one. We only had it for about six months, and we had a bomb destroyed the front of the house. And uh, so insurance came up fairly quickly. So what did I do? I bought another one exactly the same, black Ford, and then I drove it down to a certain place and sat outside for about 10 minutes to make them wonder, did we really destroy that car? <laughs> <laughs> So we know what it's like to have cars stolen and cars bombed and destroyed and all sorts of stuff like that. But friends, I want to say this. I want to say this. Those who did those things, whether it was to me or to you, they are not your enemy. They're not. They, they might well think they are. They might well set themselves up as your enemy, but they are not your enemy. They're not my enemy. You see, your enemy is not the person who does bad things to you or, said, or says bad things about you. Whether those bad things are said to your face, they're said behind your back, they're said on Facebook, or on any other, other social media platform, the person that says those things is not your enemy. Your enemy is not, is not the person who lives on the other side of the street, or the other side of the track, or even the other side of the wall. It's not your enemy. Your enemy is not the person who flies a different type of flag from the one that you fly. Your enemy is not the person who wears a different football shirt from the one you wear, unless, of course, a Manchester United shirt, then that's their, their game for it. But the fact of the matter is, people may well set themselves up as your enemy. And sometimes you might set yourself up as someone else's enemy. But the people, bottom line is, are not your enemy. We think of those who do the bad stuff, and I, you need to understand almost every person in this room, you think of your own situation when at times you did bad stuff. We've all been there. I know what it's like, breaking into houses, stealing the old gas meters, breaking into pubs, stealing the, the, as much drink as I could handle, and, and cigarettes and so on. And Sylvia, if we got, you, this place is quiet last week, Sylvia, because you weren't here, so welcome back this morning. You're welcome, Sylvia, good to see you. And you know, Sylvia comes across like an angel. Some, sometimes she comes across like an angel. And if Sylvia could tell us her story, you think, wow, the stuff that she did. But you know, we, we all did bad things in life. But we were all going through stuff. We were all facing uh, circumstances and things that made us, well, we actually blame the circumstances to, to help justify what we did. But the fact of the matter is, we were looking for something in life, and not just the stuff we were trying to take hold of. We were looking for life itself. And people are doing stuff because they truly don't know what they're searching for, and who they're searching for, and who they're looking for. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, Paul says this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, some Christians want to put a little comma in there. We wrestle not, comma. But there's no comma there. We wrestle. In other words, we do wrestle. It's not that we wrestle not. We do wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. But I want you to understand this. When Paul used that term wrestle 
or struggle. He's actually bringing about a term that the Ephesian Christians would have understood, and he knew exactly what he was saying to those who were reading us. He was talking about a life and death situation. When he talked about wrestling, he wasn't talking about WWF stuff, people uh, who had trained and, and practiced all the moves and were throwing the opponent out of the ring and throwing them back into the ring and stuff like that. He was talking here about gladiators that would go into the arena, and if there were two of them, only one was going to walk out alive. He was talking about situations that were, where there could have been a hundred gladiators put into an arena and thousands of people cheering them on as they wrestled, as they fought, as they struggled with each other, and ultimately only one person would walk out alive, that the arena would be strewn with bodies and with blood. That's what he was talking about. He was speaking about life and death situations. So he's saying that we as Christians, when we truly get hold of this, we're facing life and death situations. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers uh, and against the rulers uh, of this dark world of, of evil uh, that's in heavenly places. And so, I want to say this morning, if, if Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If it's got flesh on it, it's not your enemy. If it's got blood running through the veins, it is not your enemy. That's the big clue right there. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But he goes on to say we do wrestle against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil. These are the forces that work against everything that's good and everything that's godly. That's why when we think about the bad stuff that people are doing, we need to understand that there are forces of work, are forces of evil at work within their lives and their circumstances that people within our communities today, that they're under so much pressure. And it's not just the change in the culture. There are forces of evil at work. There are powers of darkness at work. And so we think, well, hey, you just need to make a right choice. That's, that's the easy thing to say. But the fact of the matter is people are being uh, driven along, being borne along by these forces of darkness and of evil the same powers of darkness and the same forces of evil that want to rip our communities apart. The same powers of darkness and forces of evil that want to rip families apart, want to turn marriages apart, that want to rip lives apart and destroy us. And so in this verse, Paul talks about our enemy. And he says our enemy are the powers of darkness and the forces of evil. But then Peter nails it even further, because Peter is more specific. Peter puts a personal name to it. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, your enemy, the devil. So it is not just simply say your enemy are the forces, are the powers of darkness and the forces of evil, and that's right. But he says your enemy is a person. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I have to admit, I like lions. I like watching them on television. I would not want to be able to pet one. I wouldn't be looking to do that. But I do like lions. We don't all get the opportunity like Androcles to pull the thorn out of the paw of the lion where Androcles and the lion became friends. Whether that happened in reality, I don't know. But we don't get that opportunity to do that with the lions. Maybe a few people are closer to them than others, but I don't want to be that close. But then, of course, Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if there's one lion that I want to be close to, it is the lion of of the tribe of Judah. I want to be close to Jesus. I want to be, tr- I want to be close to that lion. And, and yet, here's the strange thing. When we talk about the lion of the tribe of Judah. Isn't it crazy that Jesus is referred to as a lion, but that the devil also is referred to as a lion? I'm preaching it. But of course, this is not only, or not the only time that Jesus and the devil are compared to in a similar way. Both Jesus and the devil, for example, are referred to as the bright and morning star. 
You know that, Julian. Thank you, brother. They're both referred to as the bright and morning star. For example, in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 12, the prophet Isaiah asks this question, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to earth, you who once led low the nations. And when you study this in its context and you see what other people have to say about it, then you begin to understand that Isaiah is not just talking here about one particular individual who lived on this planet, but that he's speaking about Satan's fall from heaven. Because when he was first created, he was created as an angel of light. He was the conductor of worship in heaven. What a position that is. That's why I say to worship teams and to worship leaders that if the one thing the devil hates more above everything on this planet and in the church is worship. Because every time he sees a worship leader, he sees what he did in heaven. But how did he fail from that position? And here the prophet Isaiah is making reference to the devil as being fallen from heaven as the morning star. In Luke chapter 10, when the disciples were boasting about casting out demons, and that's what they were doing. And they were boasting about casting out demons to Jesus, and Jesus then said to them, you boast all you want. I saw Satan fall from heaven. Sometimes we think that we can boast about our abilities and what we can do. Cast out a few demons a day, and Jesus says, hey, hold on. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. We think we can boast a better ability to preach and teach. We think we can boast a better ability to make great sound with instruments and with our voices. I want to tell you, there, there, there's music going on in heaven today, the like of which we have not yet heard. There's singing going on in heaven today, the like of which we have not yet heard. There are colors that appear in heaven today, the like of which we have not seen. So we don't really impress God. What impresses God is when we do what we've preached over this past year that we get to know Him, and that we get to know Him with our heart. I saw Satan fall like lightning, he said. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, Jesus said, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And so here's the devil being referred to as the morning star. Here's Jesus being referred to as the morning star. And the morning star, without getting sidetracked in this, um, the planet Venus is the morning star. It's sometimes referred to as the dog star, the first star that appears uh, at night, and it's the last one that disappears in the morning. And it is, out of all the planets, it is unique from all the other planets. And it's one that still baffles scientists and evolutionists, because when stuff was thrown out from what they call the Big Bang Theory, and it all begins to spin away from it. It all spins in the same direction. That's it's natural laws. Yet Venus defies that. And Venus is spinning in the opposite direction. And there's so much about the planet Venus. Um, but it's, that, it is the morning stars. The, the, the first one you see at night, and you look up towards the moon, and you see a little star somewhere near it. That's Venus that you're looking at. And you also see it as the last star in the morning. So both Lucifer... Uh, Satan and Jesus are referred to as the morning star, but this does not mean that Jesus and Satan are equals. That does not mean this. Some people want to tell us that, that, that Jesus is a created being, even as Satan is a created being. Absolute bunkum, absolute nonsense. Satan is a created being, and whatever light that he had, and he did have light, and can still appear, we're told, as an angel of light. But whatever light that the devil has had or still has, it's given to him by God himself, so that the light that he had or has only exists insofar as God gave it to him. He only has what God gave him. He only has what God permits him to have. 
Even when it came to what happened with Job, it only happened because God, whatever the reason was, when I get into it this morning, was permitted at that moment in time by God. He's no authority of His own, and there's no light of His own. But Jesus, Jesus is the eternal Son of the living God. Jesus existed long before the creation that we know and understand existed. Jesus was not just given light. Jesus is light. He is the light. In fact, in John chapter 9 and verse 5, he says, I am the light of the world. I want to say, friends, that no one, no individual can ever take that upon themselves to say, I am the light of, wor- I am the, light of the world except God. No one but God can make that claim. I am the light of the world. And so just as Jesus and Satan are referred to as the morning star, so both Jesus and the devil are identified as lions. As lions. But here's the difference. The devil is compared to a lion. He's like a lion. But he's compared to a lion that is seeking to devour someone. A lion that seeks to devour and destroy others, even its own young Do you know that a male lion will eat its own cub? They're that vicious that they don't need to go and pull down a deer somewhere. If they're hungry enough and one of their own young walks past, they can take that young in a bite. Of course, we humans, us humans, we we wouldn't destroy our young. We wouldn't destroy our babies. We're better than the lions not. And so the devil is the, dev- is the devourer. The devil is the destroyer. But Jesus is compared to a lion that's king. He is the king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one who is royal and majestic. He's not just the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is king, but he's king of kings. So he says, your enemy, Paul tells us your enemy is represented by the powers of darkness and by the forces of evil. But your enemy is none other than the devil himself. He put, or Peter puts a name on him. It's the devil himself. And of course, Peter knew this by his own experience. Jesus even sought to warn Peter. He said to him, Simon, Simon. You know when Jesus, uh, or even when God, when, when the mention or he mentions someone's name twice, he wants to get their attention. Simon, Simon. Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. The devil wants to get you, Peter, but I prayed for you. That your faith will not fail. I tell your friends, the devil does not only want to mess with you, and he does that. He does not only want to mess up your life, but he's a plan to completely destroy your life. And that plan applies to every person across our communities. See, the people that we sometimes think are our enemies, the devil's messing up their lives. People on both sides of this divide, both sides of the wall, he's messing up their lives. He's destroying their lives. And here's what you need to know, friends. As a Christian in particular, you need need to know that before the roaring lion can lay a paw on you or can sink his teeth into you, he's got to come through the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I'm so glad that when the devil comes after us, that we're not on our own But at the moment that the devil begins to roar and come after us to destroy us, it's like the lion of the tribe of Judah moves in and says, you will come with this person only through me. And I'm so glad that he's got our back. I'm so glad that he's around us. He's before us. And he's there to protect and defend us. He's got your back. He's got my back. And he never lets us down. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, Paul said, God will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. He's looking out for you. 
He's looking out for you. He's not saying you won't be tested. See, a lot of Christians want an easy, smooth life. He's not saying you won't be tested. He's saying God will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able to bear. But when you are tested, he says, he will also provide a way out so you can ensure it. He's going to provide a way out. So no matter how much you're tested, you need to know today you can make it. No matter what you're going through today, you need to know you can make it. Every week I'm speaking to people on the phone, I'm connecting with people at home, whether it's in their home or hospital, meeting people here in the, in the center, talking to them about their, about their specific situations. And they're people whose hearts are being broken right now because of the stuff that's going on in their lives. And they wonder, can we ever get out of this thing? One person just a couple of nights ago, I contacted them, what's going on? Give me an update, what's happening? And their response says, Jackie, this person always called me Jackie, Jackie, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, but we're hanging in because we know that God is with us. Heartbreaking. And you need to know today that whatever we go through, however much our hearts get broken in circumstances, God will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able to bear. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. That's what God is saying. You can make it. And so when you say, I can't take this anymore, and I've heard that been said so many times, you need to listen to what God says. God says you can. God says you can. Not allowed to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but He will, with every testing, provide a way of escape, a way out. But I want you to note that although Jesus was talking to Peter when He said, Satan has desired to have you that I might sift you as wheat. See, when He used the word you, he wasn't using the singular you. Within the Greek language, there, it's quite clear you've got you, you've got singular you, and you've got plural you. Here, we just got the one word, you. How we get over it is we say usins. How many people say usins? Usins. I'm not surprised, Kelly. Usins. Or we say use, you know, um, use and usins. But in the English language, you and you is both singular and plural. So I can talk about, I can talk to you, so I'm not just talking to one person, I'm talking to you, you all. But in the Greek language, there are two different words for singular and for plural. And so when Jesus said to Peter that Satan has desired to have you, he uses the plural. So he said to Peter, the devil has desired to have you all. But I prayed for you all. I prayed for you all. And He still prays for us all. He intercedes for us today at the right hand of the Father on high. You see, friends, it's Satan's desire to have everyone, not just to single you out, but to have everyone in this place. That's His desire. His desire is to toss you around like a boat in a storm, to shake you about, to mess up your lives, to destroy our bodies to destroy our minds, to destroy our relationships, to ruin our finances, to inflict us with sickness, to cripple us with pain, to cripple us with depression, to inflict us with spiritual blindness, to bring us to an early grave. And finally, His desire for all of us is to take us to hell and land us there for all eternity. That's what He would love to achieve for every single one of us. Why? Why? Because He's your enemy, and he's my enemy. That's why he's got these plans for every person in this place. He's your enemy, and he's my enemy. He's the thief. Jesus talked about the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. <laughs> but friends, you can beat this enemy. We don't need to fear him. We don't need to fear the devil. You can beat this enemy. You can beat him by making Jesus your best friend. If you want to beat a bully, you become friends of someone who can beat the bully. Uh, I'll not even go there. <laughs> and if the devil's bullying you, if the devil's getting at you, you need to understand, friends, that Jesus stands alongside you, and he stands beside you as your friend. And he says that while the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance. Have it in its fullness, he says. 
You need to get him as your friend in order to beat the enemy. Finishing in a moment, I want to encourage you this morning, friends, to know who your enemy is, but don't fear him. Don't fear him. Be aware of, the, of his devices. Was it Peter that said that we are not unaware of his cunningly devised fables? We know what the devil's about, he's saying. We understand what he's about. You need to know what his plans and purposes are so you don't walk into the traps. You need to know who your enemy is. You need to know that he's out to get you. You don't need to fear him. There are people that are paranoid to think there's someone always out to get them. I often say to people, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean there's no one out to get you. But just because we're not to fear the devil doesn't mean that we're not to be aware of him. We are to be aware of him. We're to be aware of his devices and of his attempts to bring us down and to destroy us. But I want us to go out of this place this morning. I want us to go out of this place not fearing the devil, not even giving him a, a place in our lives, not exalting him in any shape or form, but knowing Jesus as our friend. Go out of this place knowing Jesus as your friend. Go out knowing that he'll walk with you, that you can walk with him, but also knowing that your enemy is real and knowing that you will not fall into his cunningly devised uh, traps and he sets them for you. How I, I, I get amazed sometimes that when we have an incredible time in the presence of God, that we can leave God's presence where we're all fired up, and then within a few moments, there's stuff going out in Facebook, and you think, oh, what's happened? Immediately, the devil comes to attack. And he can use us. He can use Christians. So you be careful he's not using you to get to someone else. You be careful what you're putting on Facebook. You be careful how you talk to someone else. You be careful how you greet someone else. And don't allow you to be a person the devil will use to bring someone else down. We're here to encourage each other. Amen. We're here to build each other up. Amen. We're here to support one another. I can't remember the name. Someone's going to shout it out to me of, uh, of the old preacher um, who was asleep one night and he wakened up and he looked down the bottom of his bed and he could see an image of the devil at the bottom of the bed. Who was that? Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth. Thank you. That was Wigglesworth. And so he looks down at the bottom of the bed. And then he makes this comment. He says, oh, it's only you. And then he turned over and went back to sleep again. Some of us want to look for the holy water when that happens. Or get at the cross in the name of Jesus. And there's a place for that. But sometimes you just don't want to give them space or place in your life. See, it's only you. And get back to sleep again. Sylvia, bless your love. You add to what we're doing here, you really do. We'll love you, and we'll love everyone in this church.